the book of Revelation. God's master performance. Recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on Bible prophecy, Dr. Hilton Sutton. And now a complete study of the book of Revelation. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. The Isle of Patmos that's in the Aegean Sea between Greece and Turkey wasn't a desirable place to be in John's day, and it isn't much more so today. Uh, there are a few hotels on the island. There are groups that, can, that go there for three or four days just to study the book of Revelation at the exact site where the prophecy was first given. But it, it's, it's not a, a very desirable vacation place. Why was John exiled to the Isle of Patmos from the mainland? Removed from family, removed from friends, removed from the environment of the church. Well, verse 9 tells us that he was on the island that was called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. You say, if I live by the word of God, and I keep sharing the testimony of Jesus, it might cause me a problem. Oh, it could. It has for others. And uh, you uh, don't want to turn away from the word, nor do you want to stop giving your testimony. We're going to find in chapter 12 that Satan is overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Now, here's the first instruction coming out of this book for you and I, that we must be people who will share our testimony with friends and with neighbors uh, and casual acquaintances. Uh, you want to talk about Jesus. Well, it got John exiled. However, as close as we can determine, John was between 93 and 96, when on the Isle of Patmos, he received the prophecy. He was a senior, senior citizen. Well, what a horrible way to treat a senior citizen. Wouldn't you agree? Now, he could not go back to the mainland. They could communicate by boat. If he uh, did any writings that needed to go to the mainland, it could be delivered for him. People could come over and visit with him, and there were people on the island to look after him. He wasn't put out there to die. They just wanted to get rid of him. If you study church history, you will remember that they tried on a number of occasions to assassinate John and failed. John was the only one of the 12 disciples to die a natural death. The other 11 were all put to death. John died a natural death. And uh, so they couldn't kill him. Nothing worked, so finally they just got so frustrated with his preaching the word and teaching the word and always talking about Jesus, they said, let's get rid of him, and they shipped him off to Patmos. Now, had he been like some Christians that I know today, he would have gotten all bent out of shape, and you could have heard him at a great distance saying, God, is this any way to treat me? I'm John. I was an inner circle disciple with Peter and James. Don't you remember? I got closer to Jesus than even those two. I gave you the gospel of John. First, second, and third epistles of John. Look how I've served you. And now you let me be treated this way. And God would have probably thought, should have let him kill him. <laughs> now we're going to learn something. I just set up the next verse. So look at the next verse. Uh, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <laughs> and heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, 
Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now notice verse 10. Here he is in not desirable circumstances at all. An environment that he would rather have not uh, uh, had come his way. But he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day, first day of the week, Sunday. Okay, that we know that from the scripture, that the first day of the week is called the Lord's day, and, we, and according to the calendars, it is Sunday. It is not the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday, the last day of the week. Always has been Saturday, always will be Saturday. And we find scriptures that tell us that many people of the descendants of the tribes of Israel, Jewish people, keep the Sabbath as their way of remembering the covenant. You'll find that scripture within God's word. So we, the church, place great emphasis on the day of the resurrection of our Lord. And we kick our week off with him rather than going all week long and then trying to finish it with him. We just serve him every day of the week. Now notice under very adverse circumstances and conditions, John says, I was in the Spirit. What a lesson to learn. You never want to allow your personal circumstances or conditions to govern your spiritual life. Here is a major lesson to learn from Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Never permit adverse circumstances or conditions or undesirable environment to affect your spiritual life. John didn't. And because of it, he was to do his greatest work on the Isle of Patmos in undesirable conditions at a very old age. He was to do his greatest work. This is wonderful, folks. Now, I look in the audience, and of course I see some of you uh, whose hair has turned to silver, and uh, our, our faces are not as smooth as they once were. And uh, as I've said, we can no longer dash up the stairs as we once did. And sometimes folks think, because I've been around a good many years, and I'm older now, and I'm a senior citizen, I should just take my place in the back and let all the young Christians carry on. Don't you dare. Simply because you have collected a lot of years and they show on us physically. Not much we can do about that even with the help of the uh, uh, cosmetic industry. But uh, uh, that does not mean your best years are behind you. Your best years are now. Why? Because you've been around long enough that you have collected much wisdom. You have understanding. Some of it has come uh, from your many years of studying the Word and walking with Jesus. Others of your understanding and wisdom has come through perhaps the school of experience. And you are greatly needed within the body of Christ among the younger ones who are more energetic and perhaps can carry a great amount of the a load of work that must be done. But they need you and you need to realize it just may be that now you're in a position to be your best for God. John was. And the Lord is no respecter of persons. That's the reason I'm having the best ministry I've ever had. And I, I, I'm now in my, the beginning of my 46th year of ministry. I finished year 45 this month, and, I've, and I'm in the part of the month now where I'm beginning my 46th year of ministry, and I'm, I, it's more fruitful than it's ever been. I'm enjoying it more. I'm in good health, though I am in my 71st year. And it's wonderful, folks. And I can still get up and down the stairs pretty quick. And uh, especially when I walk through a door and push a button, the elevator takes me right up. Now, but uh, folks, I'll tell you, don't let age become a determining factor of your serving God. 
Don't you do that. If you have, hit your restart button tonight. Amen? And get right back into the flow of what God is doing. And be encouraged because you have something to offer. You couldn't have served God all the years that you have and studied his word and not have a wealth of information that can be shared and is needed by those that are growing in the Lord. Men of age were a great blessing to me as I was coming up uh, uh, through the ranks uh, in years past. So what a powerful lesson uh, comes from uh, this uh, 10th verse. But notice in verse 11, he said, I heard uh, uh, a loud voice as a trumpet speaking to me, saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, first and last, what you see, write in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And he said, Then I turned, verse 12, to see the vo voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now he's going to interpret all of this for us. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, John declares, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. He took those off Satan when he stripped him of all of his armor and defeated him thoroughly when he came off of the cross and paid the ransom for our souls. Before he rose again, he had to defeat every principality and defeat Satan thoroughly and completely because Jesus was the seed of Abraham that would bruise the serpent's head, also the seed of Eve. You go back past uh, Abraham all the way to Adam and Eve, and you'll remember when the serpent deceived Eve, God took it up with him that day. You'll find it in Genesis 3.15. In fact, it's the first prophecy in the Scripture. The first time God prophesies, he prophesies to the, to the serpent, fallen Lucifer, the devil. And he said, because of what you've done to Eve, I will put hatred between you and the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman will bruise your head. Now that was a prophecy. What did, what did, Luce, what did the, uh, the devil do? He went right out and caused a problem between Cain and Abel. Cain slew Abel and Cain became disinherited and thrust out. And so he thought, go ahead, God, prophesy all you want to, unhandle it. But you see, Adam and Eve produced Seth. And they reared Seth to walk uprightly before God. Now, what does this tell me about Adam and Eve? I, I grew up being taught that Adam and Eve became totally depraved, and were forever separated from God. I studied the scripture, and the scripture does not tell me that. Theologians say that, but the scripture doesn't. They were separated from the Garden of Eden, but not from God. And God blessed their union with Seth, whom the scripture says they reared to walk uprightly before God. Had they become totally depraved, they could not have done that. Were they absolutely separated from God, that could not have occurred. From Seth came the righteous lineage, the family tree of righteousness. It produced Noah. It produced Abraham. It produced Moses. It produced David. And it produced 
Jesus. And it was Jesus, the seed of the woman, 4,000 years later, that bruised the devil's head and bruised it permanently. Folks, you and I do not have to bruise the devil's head. It is already bruised. All you and I have to do is maintain the bruise. <laughs> Amen? You need to get up every morning and after you've thanked God for a good night's sleep and another day in which to serve him and you've reported for duty, you need to say, Satan, try this on for size. <laughs> Put it on him. Keep his head bruised. And you see, we have the ability to do that. We're furnished armor, the armor of God. We're furnished weapons that are mighty through God. We're furnished the ability of the Holy Spirit. And we can keep his head bruised. Don't you ever let him up. If he starts to rear his head, put your foot on it and don't treat him with kindness. God didn't. Amen? Do you realize that when Satan found out I didn't succeed when I cut off Cain and Abel, then he's got the task of trying to cut off the seed of the woman. Walk through the Old Testament into the New, its beginning, and what do you find the devil trying to do? Cut off the seed of the woman all the way through. Is he succeeding? No. He never succeeded. Then what do we know about him? He is a master failure. If you want your life to fail, let Satan call the shots. If you want to come to the end of your way, an absolute failure, discouraged, disheartened, disappointed, let Satan call the shots. He's a failure. He knows how to do it. And he'll make the same out of anyone who follows him or permits him to be the, the greatest influence in their life. So Jesus bruised his head just like God had prophesied 4,000 years before. Can you imagine having to get up every day and look over your shoulder to see whether or not the one that was going to bruise your head is on the scene? 4,000 years of misery. Well, you need to keep him in misery also. Don't let him up. You say, well, you don't know how powerful the devil is. Yes, I do. He has no power at all. You say, what? He has no power at all. Now, I know that's not good theology today among many folks, but I take you to Matthew chapter 28. And in Matthew chapter 28, before Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives to sit at the right hand of the Father in his throne, Jesus declared all power. How much power? All. Ah, in heaven and where else? In the earth is given unto me. Satan has no power. All he has is his cunning nature of lying so as to deceive. That's the only ability that he has. He can do nothing of himself. If he does anything, he has to find a human through whom he can work to accomplish it. If he cannot find a human through which he can work, he can do nothing. He can do nothing. That's the reason we Christians need to be very, very careful about ever lending our mind, our talents, our ability, our voice, or our ears to him in any way, shape, form, or fashion. We must not do it. He's always looking for someone he can use because he can't do it himself. He has no power. So he has to find someone who's abilities, resources, talents, and character that he can usurp and use. If he can't find them, he's in bad shape. So you just make sure it's not you, and then you reach uh, uh, for others and get them into the kingdom of God. So it just means less and less folks that the devil uh, 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 can use. Well, wow, what a powerful, powerful uh, word we're getting uh, uh, out of the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, John is describing him here, and uh, what a powerful description of the Lord Jesus. And uh, he said, I just fell at his feet as dead. And he said, 
Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am I'm he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And I, and I told you he got those from Satan when he thoroughly and totally defeated him uh, before his glorious resurrection. Now look at verse 19. It supports what I told you in the first session, that there is a past tense, present tense, and future tense to the book of Revelation, and we have to abide by it. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this, past, present, and future tense. I'll point them out to you as we go through the book. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So each star represented an angel. We will find that in the book of Revelation, that the word star becomes a symbol of angelic presence. We'll find a couple of other occasions where that is the case. And then lampstands, another symbol. He said, and uh, the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, what is a lampstand? What does it do? It holds a light. So every church should be a powerful lighthouse to its community. Think, folks, if our churches are not lighthouses to our community, then we need to find out why the light got turned off or was it ever on. Now, folks, darkness does not dispel light. Light dispels darkness. On the darkest night, if one turns on a flashlight and you're in a vast expanse, darkness will flee in every direction. And that light could be seen miles away if there was nothing to uh, uh, block uh, your sight. And what did Jesus say to the church? You are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Every church should be a lighthouse in its community. And yet I hear Christians talk about darkness. In fact, I some years ago got off of a plane in a lovely city for a crusade that was to begin. It was on a Saturday, and I was to begin a crusade on Sunday in one of the high school auditoriums. And uh, my host picked me up. We got my luggage, and we were walking out of the airport. We got to the, his car. He opened the trunk. We were putting my luggage in his trunk when he said, Do you feel it? Now, I knew exactly what he was talking about because the reputation of the Christians of that lovely city was that it was the darkest city they had ever knew anything about. And all the Christians from that city, about the only subject they'd ever talk about was how dark it was in their city. And so knowing, knowing their reputation before I got there, I knew exactly what he had reference to when he says, do you feel it? And I said, feel what? And he, I, you could tell by the expression on his face, my Lord, we may have invited the wrong person here. <laughs> and he said, the darkness that's over this city. And I said, no, sir, I'm not aware of it. And then the expression on his face was, my God, we've made a mistake. He said, well, everybody else that comes here does. I said, well, not I, sir. I said, you see, According to the words of Jesus, which I happen to believe, I am the light of the world. And I just happen to have my light on. <laughs> when I got off of that plane, I got off of that plane in light, not in darkness. I've walked out here in light, not in darkness. I'm standing right here with you in light, not in darkness. And I said, now, sir, your reputation has preceded you. I said, your problem is you don't have your light on. <laughs> Anytime you find Christians talking about, oh, the darkness, all they're telling you is they don't have their light on. I'm serious. You say, but the scripture says gross darkness will cover the earth until the light turns on <laughs> or until the light shows up. Amen? Amen. And we are the light of the world. John was a light. Boy, those that were in darkness couldn't stand it because they couldn't wander around in darkness. It was too bright. 
So they want to get rid of him. Folks, don't major in darkness. You major in light. Amen? Not darkness. Now, every church then should be a lighthouse. Every individual child of God should be a glowing light for the Lord Jesus Christ. And put us all together and, ooh, uh, uh, we should be a, a, a powerhouse of mag a magnificent light. So now you've got understanding of the seven stars and the seven churches. And, of course, the two-edged sword that proceeded out of his mouth was is absolutely the word of God. So the two-edged sword is symbolic. Stars were symbolic. Candlesticks were symbolic. But we've got understanding through the word of God as to the fact that the stars identified angels, the candlestick identified the fact that churches should be a brilliant light in their community and that the two-edged sword was the going forth of the word. Chapter 2. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. Now let's pause for a moment because you're going to notice that in verse 8, it says to the angel of the church in Smyrna and in verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamos and in verse 18, to the angel of church in Thyatira. And uh, you get over into chapter 3 and the next three letters are addressed to the angel of the church in Sardis, the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the angel of the church in Laodicea. Now, I grew up being taught that this word angel meant pastor. And so when I began preaching many years ago, and if I touched on these seven letters to the churches of Asia, I would say the word angel means pastor. And there was an occasion when I was studying and the Holy Spirit said, you need to go to the Greek and look up the word for angel and the word for pastor. So I said, all right, I'll do that. And you know what I discovered? They are not one and the same. They're not even interchangeable. There is only one thing common about both words, and that is pastors and angels are messengers. That's the only thing they have in common, nothing else. And it's not interchangeable. And then I got to thinking, I had never had a pastor who was an angel. <laughs> this literally means angel of the church. This teaches us something. That every church that is a gospel light to its community and lifts up Jesus and offers salvation by and through him. To that church, there is angelic assignment to assist the pastor with the ministry of that church so that it is all the more effective. Now, I thank God that I learned this before I spent a number of years pastoring. And I was so delighted because I knew this before I began to pastor and I knew there would be an angel or angels assigned to the church that I would pastor to assist with the ministry of that church. It was my custom when I pastored that every day after I'd finished up a few chores in the office of the church, I'd walk out of the offices and close doors behind me into uh, the sanctuary and I'd spend several hours a day in the sanctuary by myself. They knew when I closed doors behind me, I was not to be disturbed unless it was an emergency that I was going in to have fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And uh, I, I'm one of those that likes to walk and pray. Give me room, okay? And so I would walk down the aisles. I'd walk in between the rows of pews. I'd walk up the stairs into the balcony and all around the balcony and back down through the ante rooms up on the platform. And I just kept walking and praying, sometimes an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours. And finally, I would come to the time where I knew I was getting ready to bring my time to a conclusion. And I'd go and kneel. And normally, I knelt by the communion table in front of the pulpit. On a beautiful occasion, I'm, I'm just enjoying the presence of the Lord, having fellowship, and I heard nothing, but I felt this. It wasn't frightening, the touch of a hand on my shoulder. Didn't frighten me at all, but I heard no one come in. But I opened my eyes and looked to see who's come in. No one could I see, but the weight of the hand was there. And I said, thank you. 
the angel a sign. Wanted me to make one just say, I'm here. I'm here. Use me. Dispatch me. Let me assist you. That happened about three times in my years of pastoring. Oh, it's wonderful, folks. I, I, you say, you're aware of angels? Yes, I am. I go no place without my angels. No place. No place, ever. You say, do you see them all the time? No, I never see them. So you don't see them? No. Well, how do you know they're there? The book says so. Amen. Amen. The book says so. Folks, either we're believers or we're religious. Exactly. Did you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm a believer. And the book says, Psalms 91, 11, and 12. And he, who's that? God. Oh, hallelujah, the Almighty. Will give you, who's that? His children. Into the hands of his angels. And they shall have charge over you. And that word charge in the Hebrew is command. Ooh, I love that. To bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot upon a stone. You say, but that's Old Testament. Oh, I'm glad you brought it up. New Testament, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 13 and 14. The subject is angels uh, in verse 13. And in verse 14 it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? Who sends them? He does. To minister. Oh, I like that. They want to be active. They don't want to just follow you around with their hands behind them, you know. Uh, they want to be active. They want to operate in your behalf if you'll recognize them and permit them and not be uh, uh, too timid uh, uh, to dispatch them in your behalf. To minister to you uh, who shall be heirs uh, of salvation. Mm. Now, if I get, I come from Methodist stock. So if I get Methodist happy, don't let that upset you, okay? That's old-time Methodists, and they'd shout, praise God. A few years back, Oral Roberts had quite an experience, and he told the whole world that an angel of some eight or nine feet tall walked into his room and looked at him and said, dispatch me. Well, I heard about it, and I had to be in Tulsa, our publishers are in Tulsa. I had to be in Tulsa to work with the publishers, and I called Oral, and I said, I want to come by and visit with you. I want the story about the angel firsthand. He said, okay, Hilton, uh, here, uh, just come by when it's convenient for you. So I went to his office later in the afternoon, and I said, after we'd visited for a while, I said, Oral, the story. He said, into my room walked this majestic angel that stood eight, nine feet tall, said he just looked at me and said, dispatch me. He said, at the moment, I thought, do what? <laughs> and the angel again said, dispatch me. And he said, by this time I knew he was wanting me to put him on an assignment in my behalf. So I said to him, we are in need of funds for the ministry. Have you ever known Oral Roberts not to need funds for the ministry? Okay? And, and what, a, what a work he's done, folks. If you've supported him any at all, what a marvelous work he's done through the years. A marvelous, marvelous man of God. And so he said to the angel, we are in need of funds. I dispatch you to go and loose the funds and bring them in. By the time I was in his office, which was about three weeks after the occasion, funds were just pouring in. Just pouring in. Folks, angels are very real. How do we know they're real? The Bible says so. What does it tell us? Angels eat real food. Oh, anything that eats real food got to be real. Would you think so? Anything that'll drive by the drive-in window of McDonald's? Got to be real. <laughs> Angels eat real food. Let me give you a reference. Uh, it's in the Psalms. Uh, and uh, where the, the, the psalmist said that God fed the children of Israel with angels' food. Another reference in the Old Testament called it manna. So run your references on the word manna or angels' food. 
and you're going to discover this was real food. And remember what God told Moses? Tell the people not to take more into their tents, that it would be ready outside their tents. Oh, front doorstep delivery. <laughs> that it would be right outside their tent, fresh every morning. Mm. Don't take more into your tent than your family can eat in a 24-hour period. Because if they take more in than they can eat and there are leftovers, it will spoil. That's real food with no preservatives added. <laughs> Amen? God fed the children of Israel on angel's food for 40 years and there was no sickness among them. Oh, they didn't need a national health program. <laughs> didn't need the American Medical Association. They ate right. Folks, Here's another place now. I'm going to throw a little something in. No extra charge, okay? Your physical body, according to the Scripture, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. According to the Scripture, not only was your soul and spirit purchased by the blood of the Lamb, but also your body. That's the reason it's resurrected, to be reunited with spirit and soul. It belongs to God. That's the reason the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, could ask them a question. What? Know you not that you are not your own, but you've been bought by the precious blood of the Lamb? And Paul says, bodily exercise profiteth a little. You need bodily exercise, and you need to be careful of your eating habit. You need to take good care of your physical body. Okay? Now, that's a lesson we just learned out of the Scripture. So, thank God that uh, we, can, we can pick up on these wonderful, wonderful truths. They ate angels' food. That, what does that tell us? Angels are real. In the East, real food got to be real. Now, angels can materialize in bodily form when it, listen to this statement, when it serves the purpose of God for your spiritual benefit. Angels will not materialize in their bodily form just so one can go around saying, I saw an angel. The only time they truly materialize is when it's going to serve God's purpose for your or my spiritual benefit. You say, have you ever seen an angel? Yes. But it's rare. It's rare. In my many, many years as a Christian, and now past 45 years of ministry, I have seen an angel twice in all these years. See, I don't really need to see them because I'm a believer of the book. And I've had so many occasions in which it was very evident they were there. During World War II, I was flying along in one of Uncle Sam's airplanes. It wasn't Canadian, it was Uncle Sam's airplane. And uh, crashed. The plane went into the ground in this attitude, nose and wing. It had just been shortly before fueled with 100 octane gasoline. When it hit, it should have exploded. I should have died on impact. It didn't explode. I was perfectly conscious the whole time. I remember well hitting the latches on my harness because I knew we were going down. I was not piloting. I knew we were going down. Someone said, did all of your life flash in front of you? No. Nope. So what were you thinking? How fast the earth was coming up to meet us. <laughs> And I leaped through a gaping hole in the fuselage. The plane was totally destroyed. And of course, when I hit the ground, I hit it running as fast as any human being has ever run in the world because I knew that thing was going to explode any minute and I wanted to be as far from it as I possibly could. After I 
had covered quite a distance and I'd not heard an explosion. I looked back over my shoulder. There was no fire. So I turned to go back to the plane because I was not the only one on board. The most serious injury, the co-pilot's right knee had slammed against the instrument panel on impact and it had cut about a half inch gash in his knee and that was all. In due course of time, we were picked up, carried into the nearest base. Medics were waiting to examine us. They ex and I said, I'm perfectly all right. They said, doesn't matter. We've got to examine you anyway. And after a while, they said, you know, you're okay. I said, yes, I told you that. I did not have a bruise. I did not have a scratch. I did not have a sore spot. I did not have a whiplash. Nothing. In three hours, I was back in the air in another airplane. To what do I attribute that? I had angelic care. There is no other explanation. And because I was on board, the other six got the benefit. I'm serious, folks. I'm serious. Folks, I want you to know, it, it is absolutely amazing. You, you've just heard about the horrible disaster in Oklahoma City. And you've heard about the uh, uh, daycare center across the street from uh, the federal building and, uh, uh, and the children that were injured in that daycare center. None of them lost their lives, but a number of them were injured. Do you know, it was reported just yesterday on, uh, on a radio station that I used to be president of some years back. One of the ladies that worked in that daycare center called the radio station in Houston that I used to be president of. It's the most listened to Christian station in the entire nation. And she said, I must tell you my testimony. Said moments before the explosion, all of our children were standing in front of the plate glass windows looking out toward the federal building. She was standing behind them and she said, suddenly, I heard myself saying, quick children, move to the back of the room. Quick, move to the back of the room. They, fought, they barely got to the back of the room when that bomb went off and blew out all that plate glass. They got some scratches and a few cuts, but no fatal injuries. And she called to give us her personal testimony. Folks, I want to tell you, it's good to have angels. Amen? Well, you see, the book of Revelation lets us in on this. May I ask a question? How many of you were aware that the book of Revelation had so much insight to angels in it before tonight? Here's a hand, another, and another. A few. Yes, a few. Uh, not even 5% uh, uh, of this audience. And it's time that we realize angels are a definite benefit that God has provided for us. Remember what the psalmist says in the 103rd Psalm? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And angels are a direct benefit. I've often said uh, uh, it's, it would be strange to have a brand new car in your garage and you walked everywhere you went. <laughs> well, that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They've got angels assigned to them, but because they have no biblical awareness uh, and no experience, uh, uh, experiences to go along with it, they never draw from that benefit. As I've said, I go nowhere without my angel. Well, each one of these letters is ascribed to the angel of the church, not to the pastor. Why? To make certain that this very important message got to the pastor so he could share it with the congregation. John, as the Lord Jesus dictated these letters to him, Jesus told him, to uh, address it to the angel of the church. In other words, put the angel of that church on assignment. There is a letter that is going to be dispatched from me on the Isle of Patmos to these pastors. Make certain that the letter arrives. Make certain. Each letter 
is just that way. Not one church. Some of these churches, Satan had managed to get into. One of them was spiritually dead, just spiritually dead. And yet the angel had not departed. When God puts an angel on assignment, that angel will not break that assignment. You say, well, could he? Oh, yes. Angels have the power of choice, just like you and I. Just like you and I, they have the power of choice. If that were not so, Lucifer and a third of the angels could never have chosen to rebel against God, but they did. So angels can make a choice. But when God, now all of the angels that are left, have proven their absolute loyalty to God, their allegiance is trusted completely. So when God puts one on an assignment, he will not break it of himself. The only way that an angel will ever walk away from one to whom God assigns that angel is that person would have to die physically, and then the angel would escort their spirit and soul right straight to heaven immediately. Or that person were to turn away from God and not just backslide. Backsliders still have angels following them around. But the angel can't, can't work in their behalf. Now that's terrible. That's like having money in the bank. You can't spend it. Amen? But when one is backslidden away from God, not serving God, uh, of the angel that's assigned to you can't work in your behalf. But he's still there. And these letters will prove that. But if one were to turn completely from God and reject him and reject Jesus and reject the word and become an apostate, that frees the angel immediately. For that person's conscience becomes seared and they're lost eternally. There's no hope for them. And that'll release that angel every time. Now that's a rare thing. It, it just, you just don't hardly find that. But it can happen, and the scriptures indicate that. So thank God for angels. Well, let's get to the letters. We'll cover as many of them as we can in the, the time remaining, and then we'll pick right up tomorrow night where we leave off. So the first uh, uh, letter is to the church at Ephesus. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, in every letter, all seven letters, there's going to be a brief description of Jesus in all seven letters, and it'll come early in the letter. I know your works. Ah, oh, this church had works. Works do not accrue to our salvation, but they do to our reward. We are not saved by works, but we are rewarded according to our works. I want you to get that, because works are spoken of numerous times within the book of Revelation. You say, well, I, I don't know so much about works. Well, stay born again, but if you don't, you know, if you don't have a record of works under the Lord, it's going to affect your reward severely. I've heard folks say, well, I've, I've got enough grace. I don't have to do those things. No, if you've got grace, then you don't mind serving God. Amen? If, you, if, if you, the grace of God will enable you uh, to do the works that we ought to do. So this church had works. And remember, works are important to your reward. And the Lord said, when I come, I will bring your rewards with me. And we're rewarded according to our works. And, and so your works are very important. Your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Sounds like a pretty fair church. A pretty good church. Works. Labor, patience, can't bear those that are evil, test those that have uh, declare themselves to be certain things and find out they're not, 
and that you continue uh, uh, in patience and uh, labor for his name's sake. You're not weary in, do, in, in doing it. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You say, how could they have these good attributes and have left their first love? Folks, our churches are filled with it. Do you remember your first love? That first encounter with the agape of God? Ooh, it came over us like a wonderful blanket was glorious. We had such zeal and such strength because this love of God releases the joy of the Lord in you. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Couldn't shut you up. You remember? Couldn't keep you from church. Couldn't, couldn't prevent you from serving God. You didn't, you didn't even try to think up reasons why you couldn't do certain things. Uh, you were challenged uh, to do what you thought maybe would be difficult to do and oftentimes discovered you could do it. But you lose your first love, and what do you do? You go about it mechanically. And we've got a lot of Christians today that are serving God mechanically. They're not serving God motivated by love. They'll still go to church. They'll still perhaps even tithe, give an offering, pay a little attention to what the preacher is preaching, but they don't have that glowing love of God they once had. Consequently, the joy of the Lord has subsided. Well, with the joy of the Lord having subsided, their strength, their spiritual strength is not the same. And so they struggle to serve God. When I was pastoring, I always taught my people, if you find yourself struggling to serve the Lord, something is wrong. And generally, you've lost your joy. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if we've got strength, we don't struggle with it. We handle it. And why would one lose their joy? They've let that agape love slip away from them and then they make substitutions for it. And that's what this church was doing. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, now he's saying, think back. And some of you here tonight should do this. Think back. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Oh, please notice that this letter indicates that one has not maintained uh, his uh, uh, relationship with the Lord if he or she has let the love of God begin to slip away, and therefore you're serving God out of duty rather than motivated by love. I've known a lot of preachers couldn't wait till they got to be 65 so they could retire because the last 10 years it was a struggle. I have no plans to retire. You see, if all we preachers read the fine print of our contract, there's no retirement clause. It's true. Paul writes it. He says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In other words, non-negotiable. When one accepts a call from God, he accepts it for a lifetime. I'm in the ministry until I can't preach any longer. My father stayed in full-time ministry until he was 90. Folks, I want you to know that God makes a way very beautifully. Well, this church was doing it uh, mechanically, making substitutions, and the Lord said, remember where you, from where you have fallen? Here's how you correct it. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Repentance is the manner in which we correct all these things. So I want to just pause here and we'll pick it up 
in our next session, right with verse 6 of the letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, we're right on target. We're in excellent shape. So we'll pick it right up with this verse because it's a very important one. I want you to see it as we begin our very next session. We'll complete this letter, all of the others, and get on over into the action where chapter 4 gets underway.